Aloha. Happy Aloha Friday. Welcome to another episode of From the Editor's Desk. It's great to be here. I know this is a little departure from what I normally do on Saturday mornings, but I'll explain. But first, let's just have coffee, shall we? It's the end of the workday on Friday. Mm. I am enjoying a lovely lavender latte in my Love's Bakery mug from Hawaii. Um, Love's Bakery that had been around in Hawaii for 170 years. Look at the years on there. Do you see that? That's 1851 to 2021. So they closed down last year. Of course, due to the pandemic, the pandemic is one of those things that really pressed and squeezed on this business that had been around for a long time. But good news is that a bakery on the mainland in Portland, and it's called Franz Bakery. Hello, Franz. But Franz Bakery licensed the use of the name and the recipes for Love's Bakery. So now Love's Bakery is still being distributed on the Hawaiian Islands through a mainland supporter. So we appreciate you, Franz Bakery, for keeping uh, the love, the aloha from Love's Bakery alive. So if this is if this is your first time to catch me, and some of you who are friends of mine, this might be your first time catching me because I'm usually on Saturday mornings. But today I'm on because I had a little medical thing that happened uh, today. I had to go in to get an infusion. If you followed my story for a while, you know that um, I um, am coming out, just coming out of cancer treatment about a year and a half ago. So I have to go get these infusions. I'm still in those first, you know, few first years uh, and months after my treatment. And so I have to get these infusions every six months. And so Today was the day for one of those, right? At the beginning of the year, time to get it so that I will get it next time in um, July. And so it's an infusion that helps strengthen my bones to prevent recurrence. Um, so yeah, that's why I did that today. And so one of the side effects it says is it's supposed to make me feel like I have flu-like symptoms for the next few days. So that being said, I wanted to go ahead and, and do my live stream show for you. So again, if this is your first time to catch me and you're like, who is this person? I don't even know who this woman is. She just randomly showed up in my feed because if you're an author, if you love books, if you love stories, if you love writing stories, that's why I popped up in your feed. So if you've never met me before, you've never seen me on here before, welcome. Thanks for being here. My name is Ronnie Harden. By trade, I am an editor. I'm a content writer. I'm a writing coach. I love to help authors create their stories, polish their stories, and publish their stories. So that's what I do for work. And I occasionally come on here and I share little tidbits like new books coming out or different tips and things to help you in case you want to write your own story. So this is a little live stream segment. I've been doing live streaming for quite a while. I started back in 2014. So I've been live streaming now for almost eight years. And so this show has evolved from previous iterations that were on Periscope and then on, it's been on Facebook Live. Now I'm broadcasting simultaneously to a couple of channels on Facebook and my YouTube channel. Um, and so I love getting to share helpful things that if, if you're thinking about sharing your story or even writing, um, that's what I'm here to talk about. So today we are going to talk about uh, defining your audiences and defining literary genres. Because when you think about books, you hear things, you hear this term, literary genre, or People will ask you, what is your favorite genre? When you go into a bookstore, you notice that the bookstore is divided up into different categories, right? Different genres of reading because there's all kinds of stories out there for you to enjoy. 
But if you're a writer, if you want to write, and I mean, this could be anything. This could be a DIY guide on how to live stream. It could be a DIY channel because you're a health and fitness expert, or maybe you like to cook. Um, You could be an academic writing a textbook. You could be a fantasy writer and you love stories, or maybe you love writing stories for kids or young adults, right? Um, maybe you want to write a book about finance. Maybe you're you're really good in the financial world. Or maybe there's other things that you do that you want to write a book about. Well, those are all possibilities of ways that you can share your content. And they don't necessarily have to be just books. They could be e-blasts. They could be small little um, e-pamphlets that you do to a mailing list. It could be an article that you write. Uh, for an online magazine or a print magazine, right? You can maybe contribute to a peer-reviewed uh, journal. You might be involved in doing some research. I mean, who knows? The the opportunities now for sharing your content are endless. So, I wanted to. I've been. I'm doing this little series in the month of January called "So You Want to Write a Book." So that if you are interested in writing a book, hopefully some of these tips and these things that I'm going to share with you will help encourage you to write your story. I mean, after all, it's what we're here for, right? we got stories to tell, just like I have stories to tell from my coffee cup collections. You get to learn about them. So, but how, you know, and I'm also going to share with you why knowing the genre of your book the style of writing that you enjoy, clearly knowing who that is, how that's going to help you define your audience, because that's a very part um, important co- uh, component to being an author. Who are you writing this story for? So first of all, I'm going to go through the literary genres and then the nonfiction genres, because there are a total of 23 different categories, if you will, main categories that you, your writing may fall under. So I kind of want to go through some of these with you so you understand. And maybe by my sharing, this will help you sort of pinpoint where you fit in the in writing genres. What is your best fit? What is your passion? And then figure out ways to help build an audience of readers for you to share your content with. Okay. So we're going to be going through this one at a time. So I'm going to be sharing that, that there are 14 different literary genres. If you watch the opening uh, video to this show, there are 14 literary genres. And what we mean by that is this is, this is the category for fiction writing. There is fiction writing and there is nonfiction writing. And so even within those two headings, there are several categories. So the first one is literary Fiction. Now, literary fiction novels are considered works of artistic value and literary merit. They often include political criticism, social commentary, and reflections on humanity. Literary fiction novels are typically character driven and not plot driven, character driven. So we follow a character's inner story and we learn all of so it's really not about the plot and the things that are going on it's following this character okay so it's literary fiction um the second one the next genre we're going to talk about is mystery mystery writing mystery now this is not to be confused with thrillers that's the next category but mystery writing is also known as detective fiction where you follow a detective and solve a case, right? So we have um, Agatha Christie, where we follow Hercule Poirot, um, Miss Marples, there's, you know, uh, Sherlock Holmes. There could be a a different, uh, there's, um, I don't know if Gabriel Alon is really a detective per se, but he solves cases. Um, So, This is, you're usually following a detective or a character who is acting as the detective to solve the case. So you are dropping clues all along the way for people to follow so they can try to solve the crime or solve the mystery, right? 
Um, Agatha Christie is a great mystery writer. So they usually start with a very exciting opening, exciting hook to get you, oh my gosh, like oh. um, Kenneth Branagh is releasing a new um, movie of Agatha Christie, Death on the, Death on the Nile is coming out uh, pretty soon. The trailers are out for that. That should be a really, and so you follow Hercule Poirot as he tries to solve the mystery of the death on the Nile. And if you haven't read the book, that's a great one to read. Um, and it's a great example of this kind of fiction. So mystery novels will start with a really exciting hook. They keep readers inter inter interested with what's called suspenseful pacing, right? It builds the suspense, but it does it at an even pace. We're not speeding through. Okay. And then it ends with a satisfying conclusion that answers all of the reader's outstanding questions like, Oh, but wait, but what happened to that guy? Or wait, what happened to, you know, all of those questions that you, you build in your mind as you are reading a mystery, those are solved by the end of the book. Now, the next genre we're going to talk about is thriller. Cause this is thriller, not Michael Jackson's thriller. Close. But thriller novels are dark and mysterious and suspenseful plot-driven stories, okay? So there is a plot. They very seldom include comedic elements of any kind. Um, thrillers keep readers on their toes and use plot twists, red herrings, and cliffhangers to keep them guessing till the very end, right? So again, it's plot-driven. So we're, we're, we're going somewhere with this, but there are unique turns and, and twists that the story takes and cliffhangers and, oh my God, I would have never thought that's difference than mystery. Okay. I want to make sure we clarify the difference between what a detective fiction story is where we're following the detective and he's dropping clues and, and he's keeping us, you know, with a suspenseful pace, but thrillers are a little more dark and a little more like it's not just suspense. It's you feel the tension and the fear and there's a plot that is being followed to get you to the end, but you don't know the end till the very end. If that makes sense, the author can turn it and twist it and, and then the end can be completely different than what you thought. Okay. That's a thriller. That's the beauty of that genre. Now, the next genre is horror. Now, <clears throat> this genre is not my favorite. I try not to read these kind of books. I have read them in the past for school. Uh, it's not my favorite genre. <laughs> but horror novels are meant to scare, to startle, to shock, and to even repulse readers. Generally focusing on themes of death, demons, evil spirits, and the afterlife, they prey on fears with scary beings like ghosts and vampires and werewolves and witches and monsters. In horror fiction, plot and character are tools used to elicit a terrifying sense of dread. So plot, <coughs> in other words, where the story is going and characters are developed in such a way to make the person feel scared. If you follow any of like the Scream movies or Friday 13th, <coughs> there's a character, right? There's Freddy Krueger in Friday the 13th. In Scream, it's the guy with the knife, whatever. Um, <coughs> and between those characters and the definite plot, ooh, excuse me, um, those create a sense of dread in the reader to where they want to stay up and read all night. They want to know what happened because they can't put the book down. And then when they put the book down, they don't want to go to sleep because they're scared. That's what a good horror story does. Okay. Now, the next one is one of my favorite categories. It's the historical category. Now, historical fiction novels take place <coughs> in real times and real places. They transport the reader back in time. And this is when you have to really do your research. And if you have a really good uh, team of people helping you, or maybe you're doing it yourself and you've done some extensive reading and studying about a certain place or a certain time period in history. <coughs> oh, 
you can you can take your readers back to a time. If your story involves time travel and your characters are going back in time, that's pretty creative. So you can actually go back in time to now these can be you can have um you can have real imagined or combination of both. But most historical novels will use actual historical figures or historical events within a historical setting. I remember that there was a movie made where a a Abraham Lincoln was like a vampire killer, right? So you can use real people and real place in a real time setting, but you can have, you know, because again, this is historical fiction. So you can set your story back, you know, during the Civil War or travel back in time to the ancient Greeks or into biblical days, right? And your characters can be doing things and have things going on within a, a actual time period or historical setting. But the story can be fictional, right? That's very different from nonfiction. And that's why I wanted to go through these genres to help you understand because sometimes people, when I'm helping them decide where what category their book's going to go in, they're kind of all over the map. When we narrow it down to the categories that you're going to want to really focus on, especially if you're going to put your book on Amazon or distribute it in bookstores, you want to make sure that you are clear on who your audience is and, and where best to distribute to those audiences. Now, the next category I'm going to touch on is, is romance, romance novels. Just mentioning that, you already know kind of what they're about, but romance centers around love stories between two people. It can take place anywhere, anytime, but the main focus of the book is the love story between two people. They're usually lighthearted and optimistic, and they have an emotionally satisfying ending. Ah, oh, the girl gets her guy. The guy gets her girl. Um, the, the guy may get his guy. Who knows? Um, it might be two puppies, right? Lady and the Tramp. Whatever it is, it's a love story. So sometimes romance novels contain conflict and plot twists, but it never overshadows the relationship between the two characters who are in love, which, again, always prevail at the end because that's the reason why we read romance stories because we want to go, oh, I loved that book, right? It's important. So romance stories. And of course, next month is February where we're going to be talking about romance stories. We are going to be um, reading them. There's going to be, Hallmark is going to be filled with movies, right? With love stories for the love month. Now, the next genre is Westerns. Again, not one of my faves, not the first pick if I want to watch something or read something, but I have read books in this genre to stretch me and make me try something out of my comfort zone. That's another thing you might want to try. Read a book in a different genre outside of what you would normally pick just to stretch your reading comfort zone because it always helps you get creative about your writing. It also helps you think of different things. So Westerns tell the stories of cowboys and settlers and outlaws exploring the Western frontier and taming the American Old West. They're shaped specifically by their genre-specific elements and rely on them only in ways that novels in other fiction genres don't. Westerns aren't as popular as they once were. The golden age of the genre coincided with the popularity of Western films in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. I read a book set in a Western period, and it had to do with a woman, with women outlaws. Um, gosh, I would have to... I have to find the book. I can't believe I can't remember the story, the title of the book. I'll have to find that for you. But I did read one um, in the, just in the last year to sort of stretch my, my writing ability. Because again, if I have an author that comes to me that has that kind of a story, you know, I'm going to want to make sure that I'm keeping myself fresh and open to other writing genres. There are certain genres that I tend to work more in, which I do a lot of nonfiction work, but I do love fiction work as well. Now, the next uh, category is an interesting word, but it's called a Bildungsroman. Bild, I mean, just as it 
I mean, just as it's spelled right there, Bill Dung's Roman. Now, this is a literary, literary genre of stories about a character growing psychologically and morally from their youth to adulthood. These are the coming of age stories. Okay. Generally, they experience a profound emotional loss. They lost a parent, they lost a sibling, they lost a pet, they lost a friend, right? And so they set out on a journey, they encounter conflict, and they grow into a mature person by the end of the story. So literary, literally translated, the word Bildungsroman is novel of education or a novel of formation. So again, these are the coming of age stories. Um, this is the, um, oh gosh, Nicholas Sparks writes a lot of these. Um, um, gosh, I'm trying to think of a couple. There's, I can see the covers, but I can't see the titles. Um, the author's name is Green. His last name is Green. Is it John Green, I believe? And um, he's written some of those types of tales. So again, the coming of age stories that we see. Um, so I'll be sharing more about that as we talk more throughout the months about different uh, genres, different categories, and especially when I feature different authors and talk about their books. But Bill Dung's Roman, again, a coming of age story, a novel of education. Now, the next one is called Speculative Fiction. Now, this is a kind of like a subgenre that encompasses a number of different types of fiction, from science fiction to fantasy to dystopian. These stories take place in a world different from our own. Speculative fiction knows no boundaries. There are no limits to what exists beyond the real world. So that's what speculative fiction is. It's stories that take place in a world different from our own. Um, Michael and I have been watching a show, I don't know which uh, streaming channel it is, but it's called Foundations, and it, it's uh, dealing with the human race years in advance, and they're also dealing with different um, planetary beings and, and their worlds coming together with them. Um, the, the book Dune is a great example of speculative fiction, okay? Then we have science fiction. Now, let me explain the difference between speculative and science. So science fiction novels are speculative stories with imagined elements that don't exist in the real world, okay? So <coughs> speculative fiction takes place in a world not of our own, but science fiction has elements in it that would never exist in the real world. <coughs> For example, time travel. We don't time travel. So in Dune, that would be considered <coughs> a science fiction story because you're dealing with the spice planet that is an agent to help them time travel. That's why it's such a, a cherished element to have and all the worlds are battling people of the planet uh, for control of that spice. So that's something that is not of our world. So some are inspired by hard natural scientists like, uh, like physics, chemistry, and astronomy. Others are inspired by the soft social sciences like anthropology or sociology. Common elements of sci-fi novels include time travel, space exploration, and futuristic societies, like I was telling you about in uh, Dune. So the next category is fantasy. Okay. Fantasy. Now, fantasy novels are also speculative fiction stories with imaginary characters set in imaginary universes. So <clears throat> you have speculative fiction. Okay. But underneath that umbrella, you have science fiction and you have fantasy and you have dystopian. So fantasy is imaginary characters in imaginary universes. You could have talking unicorns. You could have dancing bears. They could be inspired by mythology or folklore. They could include elements of magic, right? 
So the fantasy genre is where now you're opening up to also children's literature. Think of things like Alice in Wonderland or Clifford the Red Dog, right? Um, the Harry Potter se uh, series is fantasy. Um, Lord of the Rings is fantasy, okay? So all of these come under the category of of fantasy and they're also speculative fiction now the next one underneath the speculative fiction heading right is dystopian novels now these are a type of science fiction but they are they are specific in that they are set in societies that are viewed as being worse than the one that we live in so if you think of it like hunger games right the maze runner different uh different stories where the place where the people live <coughs> is so futuristic and really really terrible and different from ours uh the handmaid's tale that's a huge dystopian story 1984 another dystopian story uh brave new world these are all a specific type of storyline within the speculative fiction heading. The last two are interesting. One is called magical realism, right? Magical realism. How can those two words work together as a literary genre? Well, these are novels that depict the world truthfully, but also add magical elements the fantastical elements aren't, view, aren't viewed as unique or odd they're considered normal in the world in which the story takes place the genre was born out of the realist art movement and is closely associated with latin american authors so if you think of stories like uh i don't know um trying to think of one of the disney movies Oh gosh, what was the one with where they featured the Day of the Dead in it? I'm trying to remember. Anyway, so there are there are truthful elements of uh, in the story, but then there are also magical elements, right? So, and then the last one is called realist literature. And realist fiction novels are set in a time and place that could actually happen in the real world. They depict real people and places and stories in order to be as truthful as possible. Realist works of fiction remain true to everyday life and abide by the laws of nature as we currently understand them. This could be a story about, I don't know, um, a, a guy and a girl who work together as computer nerds in a accounting office. And it follows their story of them working at the company. Okay. So it could be a fictional story. You could make up fictional characters, but everything about what they're doing and where they live and where they're going are actual places that would happen in the real world. They're doing things that real people would do. And so sometimes those stories have to do more with the characters because they're living in life situations that we can relate to, but we relate to the characters and understand what they're going through. So those are all the fiction categories and genres. Now let's look at some nonfiction titles because this is what I work in mainly. I love helping people who are telling their stories. Um, and it's really important to understand, again, what these categories are because if you think of building your audience, who is your reader? If that reader was to be a person sitting with us at the table having coffee, who is that person? What do they look like? What do they like to read? What do you think they would like to read? Who is that person that you have a message to send to? Okay. So here are some of the most prominent types of nonfiction genres. So again, you have history showing up. What's the difference between history in fiction and history in nonfiction? Well, <laughs> it's because it's, it's real stuff. Nonfiction has to do with real historical accounts. So say you're writing a book about Shakespeare. You're writing a book about um, King Henry VIII and his six wives. If you are writing a book about, um, I have some up here on my, um, can I go up here, right? We have some 
people's stories that we we're going to talk about that genre as well. But history has to do with um, over on the far end down there are all my British history books because I love especially the Tudor period. That's one of my favorite time periods in history. So I love stories about that. But these are actual historical books about people who lived in the past and the places where they lived. Some histories dwell purely in objective facts. Other histories are refracted throughout the lens of the author's personal beliefs. In either case, history books must present true stories in order to qualify as nonfiction. Now, um, so I've done a couple of history type books uh, with an author sharing history about a time period. This is the category I've done a lot of work in, uh, biographies, autobiographies, and memoirs. I have a lot of those up here on the shelf. Barbara Streisand, Elizabeth Taylor, um, Audrey Hepburn, Betty White's book, um, Barbara Walters. A lot of people up there that I've, uh, I love to read. And I also have some stories that I've helped people tell their own life story. So this is a, a, a section of literature that focuses on the life story of a particular subject. Biographies are usually written in third person about someone. <clears throat> okay, so someone is telling the story of a person, right? They're writing, so they're writing a book about Audrey Hepburn. They are, they worked with them or they are, they've collected and done a lot of research on this person and they are writing the book about them. Um, Walter Isaacson has done that a lot with his biographies that he's done on Steve Jobs. I think he did one on um, Churchill. So he's done a lot of biographies. Those are important. Now, autobiographies is when the subject is writing their own story right? Autobiographies and memoirs. So um, autobiographies usually tell the entire story. Memoirs will, will tell selected stories, maybe certain memories that that person wants to tell, not their whole, you know, life. So while autobiographies and memo memoirs are ne by necessity written by someone who is currently alive at the time, biographies can be written about someone they can be living or dead, but autobiographies and memoirs are usually written by the person when they are alive. Um, case in point, I know that when Cicely Tyson's book came out, she had just finished it and was getting ready to promote it when she passed away. That threw the publisher in a little bit of a loop, She, but thank goodness she finished it and she narrated the audiobook. So it was wonderful to have her voice telling her story. So that's silly. Important. So biographies, autobiographies, and memoirs. Um, I've done work in this as well. Um, travel guides and travel logs. Okay. There's a difference. So travel logs are kind of a close cousin of memoirs in that they recount an author's specific experience traveling somewhere. Who could I write some travel logs, right, and publish them? I could write one about um, traveling in Hawaii. I could write one, uh, uh, a short one about my recent trip to the Galapagos. I don't know that it would be a travel log in a print form, but it could be something that I could write and have either on my website or submit to a travel magazine, which would be great, right? But travel guides are more instructive. They're the books that you pick up that tell you you know, what to go see in a certain place or the best restaurants and the best um, attractions and parks and museums and those kinds of things, right? So that's a travel guide, uh, difference between travel logs. So those can be a fun way for you to write. If you travel a lot for your job or for what you, you know, how, if you just travel in general, you could get into this kind of writing and be pretty successful at it. Um, the next kind of nonfiction is academic texts. Again, like I said before, maybe you're contributing to a peer-reviewed journal. Maybe you're on a research team. Um, maybe in your department you are you are writing something that's going to be um, a textbook for a classroom, right? Um, 
if you are going to be doing an online course, those are academic texts. Those are learning materials. They are designed to instruct readers on a topic. So if you've created an online course, you're writing academic texts, right? And there are certain guidelines for like for, for published textbooks that are being used in colleges, universities, and schools, there's a certain level and a certain style guide that are used to publish those kinds of books. But if you are writing something that is instructional, that is um, qualified education for a person so that when they take your course, they receive a certificate or they master a certain level of qualification or um, they master a skill, those are all academic texts. Um, the next type of book is called Philosophy and Insight. This is a category in nonfiction that is kind of a close cousin to academic texts. And a lot of times these books are published in affiliation with a university or a university-affiliated publishing house. This runs the gamut from traditional philosophy like Plato, Aristotle's, and Descartes to scientific theories, to analysis of scientific or cultural phenomena. I've not had a lot of experience in this category because you have to have a knowledge of those academic fields to be able to work with those kinds of texts. And in my, in my editing group, I've seen requests go out. A lot of times people look for an editor and they're looking for someone with experience or a degree in those fields because they're familiar with the terminology, they're familiar with uh, the, you know, the, the projects, the things that people are working on, and that takes a specific type of training. So philosophy and insight, definitely a nonfiction genre, not one I've had a lot of experience in though. Now the next one, the next one I definitely have had experience in because, um, Oh, did I skip it in my notes? I sure did. Hold on just a second. I'm going to add it right now. Ah, I was creating my slides and I forgot this one. Oh my goodness. Can't believe it. Okay. Well, here we go. And I'm going to move this up here into my list. How did I miss this in my notes? Well, that's what happens when you get an infusion. <laughs> All right. So this one is interesting for me because this is what I got a degree in. It's journalism. And right now in our current world for the last, gosh, how many years now? At least four or five. We've had a bad light cast on the, the area of journalism. So let me explain to you a little bit about what it is, because this is a broad subgenre of nonfiction that encompasses different types of media. But journalism is most regularly consumed in the form of online newspapers, magazines, monthly journals, TV news reports. Um, it's, it's a broad category. However, journalism reports on true events that typically, but not always, have relevance to a contemporary audience. Journalism can also take the form of books. This includes narrative nonfiction, and true crime books. Some of these books, like Losing Earth by Nathaniel Rich and Memphis Rent Party by Robert Gordon, straddle the line between journalism and history. The best journalism can receive acclaims like the Pulitzer Prize and the Peabody and the Polk Awards for excellent storytelling. So this has to do with telling real life stories that engage a lot of, of people um, and hap, ha, you know, happen to relate to their real life and is helpful to them for either informative purposes or just you know something that makes their life better. Um, I used to do a column in my school newspaper that was kind of, uh, it was called Did You Ever Notice? And I would pick up on stories of things that people really wouldn't sort of think about. And yet when you really looked at them, they were really important. Um, and sometimes I would make light of them. Um, and what started my column was a story about um, why there were no red M&Ms. There used to be red M&Ms, but then when red food dye was a problem, red M&Ms were done away with. And so I wrote this sort of tongue-in-cheek um, story and from a kind of like a, a racism, um, not a racism, but a 
a, a cultural conflict. I was like, well, why are there two brown M&Ms, but there's no, there's no red M&Ms and we got green and blue and orange and who got to pick those and yellow and who got to pick those. And I made it into this sort of tongue in cheek story when actually it was, it was about M&M candy um, because I wrote the story in government class <laughs> to fill a page on my paper. And so it was a fun way to start a column that really dealt with um, important things that people cared about and sh shone a light on them and did it in a funny sort of satirical way, made people laugh about it so that they didn't take themselves so seriously. So that was what got me into the love of journalism. And I really wanted to someday work for a newspaper and have my own column. Instead, I have my own live stream show. And that's kind of fun. So the next category is self-help and instruction. I do a lot of work in this category too. This is where uh, there are some of the b most best-selling books in this category. One of my business mentors is John Acuff. I follow him. He is in the self-help and business instruction category. A lot of these books will concern business success, um, you know, strategies to build your business and improve it. Um, relationship advice, getting it um, organized. Marie Kondo's book, right, was a huge success in the self-help uh, world. Um, the Home Edit uh, ladies, really, really uh, big. And so they wrote a book. They've had a couple of books come out on organizational tools and tasks for the home. Um, any financial management books, right? Um, if you think of any of your top financial people who are writing books about making money, investing well, starting a business, all of those books are under self-help and instruction. Then we have guides and how-to manuals, right? So this is related to the self-help genre, but more focused on special skills, right? This is where your cookbooks are. This is where your um, athletic and health and fitness books are. This is where your tutorials are for DIY folks who are uh, everything from making your own jewelry to clothing to building your own home to anything that you're trying to build, right? Guides and how-to manuals. This is where we are learning. We are getting instructed, but they but this category focuses on a specific skill, right? So again, your cookbooks are going to come under guides and how-to manuals. And then the last one is one of my favorites, humor and commentary. This is a form of creative nonfiction where analysis and reflection on real world events are distilled down through the prism of the author's point of view. They may take a comical view, spin on it. They may talk about it. Sometimes that point of view can be humorous. Sometimes it's political. Sometimes it's purely meditative. What prevents this subcategory from being fiction is it is rooted in objective events, both present and historical. So that right there is my description of the 23 different genres. And why is this important? It's important because as an author, say if you go onto Amazon and you want to buy a book, have you ever gone onto Amazon and looked at the book categories? How many book categories are there? A lot of book categories, right? So when I work with authors and I tell them, who is your audience? Let's define your audience because once you know who your audience is, you know who to write for. And when you are looking at publishing your book, you want to know which categories your book is going to fall in so that you can focus on distributing it to those categories for best sales efforts, right? Because if you don't know who your audience is and who you're writing to, you're going to be writing all over the place. So I hope this has helped you because when you want to build your audience, you want to focus on finding out who your audience is. I recommend that you walk in a bookstore. Where, where are you drawn? What are the book covers that you're drawn to? What are the categories that you're drawn to? Where are your people? And then look for people who are looking at those books. How old are they? Where do they work? Do they work at home? Are they moms at home with kids? Or are they professional women? Are they uh, dads that are finance guys? Or are they mechanics looking for a book on how to change out a transmission, right? Who's your audience? Define that audience clearly and maybe knowing what your genre is 
will help you be able to define that audience, fine tune your writing, and tell an excellent story. And if you need help, you know that's what I'm here for. Speaking of great stories, we're reading this one for our January book club. It's called Saving Grace by Kirsten Powers. Speak your truth, stay centered, and learn to coexist with people who drive you nuts. Yes. So it's interesting. Again, this is a nonfiction book. And she is, uh, let's see if I've got her categories in here. Sometimes it will tell you in the opening credits of a book. You see all these little identifiers here on the page? tells you all the little categories that her book is under. I don't know if you can see that really well. See there? You notice all of the different identifiers, right? Social conflict, United States history, 21st history, social sciences, United States history, right? Political culture. Those are all of the headings, the categories of where her book best fits, right? Then for the month of February, I'm super excited, but we are going to be diving into Brene Brown's new book called Atlas of the Heart. You'll definitely want to sign up for the book club for February. We're going to go through this. She's going to take us through, um, what is it? 87 of the emotions and experiences that define what it means to be human. If you are, if you're familiar with Brene Brown, if you're a fan of her TED Talk, if you listen to her podcast, um, this is her book that came out. We're going to dive into it the month of February in our book club. So you can sign up to join. And in fact, our first book club discussion of 2022 is going to be this coming Tuesday night. So if you'd like to jump in just to see what it's like and then maybe grab a copy of this book. So you can read it. We're going to have one on the 18th. And then February 1st, we're going to get together to discuss this book in summary. And then we're going to dive into and start reading this one on February the 1st. So I would love for you to join me if you can. Um, love having new folks in the book club. So if you would like to join the book club or if you need any help with your writing, with uh, reading and understanding so that you can be a better writer, let me know. That's what I love to help people do. You can contact me here at ronaharden.com forward slash contact. Drop me a note. Let me know um, if you'd like to be part of the book club, if you need some, uh, some information, or you would like to meet with me for a quick coffee and just ask some questions. I do that too. I have free 30-minute consultations. And I'd love to answer your questions if you have them. So I hope this has been helpful, kind of explaining all the different literary genres. Thanks so much for hanging out with me. I know this is so different from my Saturday show. And I will be back next week on Saturday where we are going to be talking about, what are we going to be talking about? I have all my headings. I'm trying to remember what we were going to talk about. Um, anyway. Whatever it is, it's going to be about writing a book. One of, one of the weeks I'm going to be talking about how an editor is your friend. Editors are your friends. Don't think we're scary people ready to chop your book up. We might do that, but it's only to help you tell your best story. So let me know how I can help you. If you need some help with your story, or if you would like to learn more about these different writing genres and how best you can focus your writing and get your story out there, to bless someone with it. Okay. All right, guys, listen, have a great weekend. It's going to be holiday weekend. I hope you're going to enjoy yours. I'll be back here next week on Saturday, my normal scheduled time to have coffee with you and talk more about you writing your book. All right. Take care. I'll see you guys soon. Thanks.